Okay, so left, yesterday I left, I left us with a question. Um, the Rambam brought the famous Gemara that when you compare about tshuva with a tzaddik gomer, someone who's reformed himself from having committed transgressions versus someone who's never committed the transgressions, that the former is superior, both in receiving reward and in his status. It's quite clear that both of them are included. The reason for that is, as Raman puts it, Torah time shall avera. This Balchuva has tasted the taste of the sin, and he now has to work harder to overcome his desire for it. Whereas the Tzaddik has never experienced it, he doesn't have that experiential attraction to it. So he doesn't have to work so hard to avoid the transgression. We have a rule that. Um, the, the reward that you get depends upon the effort that you have to put in to do the right thing. And also, not only do you get a higher reward, but you have a higher status. Now, I don't know anywhere where the Rumba uh, describes in the detail what the higher status is, but my Revison suggests that by being willing to put out the extra effort, to overcome the resistance, you show how much you appreciate the mitzvah. You show where it stands in your priorities, in your scale of values. And that, the fact that you appreciate it, the fact that you think it's worth sacrificing for, means that you are on a higher spiritual level. So I can hear that, as, as independently of the fact that you're going to get more reward. Um, and this, I think, um, goes together with something which I'm trying to remember whether I mentioned it to you or not. Um, you know that we wear fringes on our garments called tzitzis. Now, you're used to seeing white strings. If you look around, you see some people with blue strings in addition to the white strings. The original mitzvah that the Torah puts down is that the fringe should have both white and blue strings. How many is a discussion, but there should be both. The Mishnah in, in, um, in uh, Blanachos says that a person who wears all white has satisfied the mitzvah, not best. He really should have had blue and white. But if he does all white, he satisfied the mitzvah. And if he does all blue, he satisfied the mitzvah. So then the question is, is there any difference between the two failures? They are failures to do it best. The failure of doing all white, the failure of doing all blue. If so, which one would be worse and why? And it turns out that wearing all blue is worse than wearing all white. That's not exactly obvious. There's a symbolism in the blue. The blue is like the sea, and the sea is like the, hot, the heavens, and the heavens are like the throne of glory. Right? It's not obvious that all blue is worse than all white. And one way of explaining it is, think of the damage, the, the pagam in Hebrew, the demerit of what you left out. The guy who puts on all white, he left out the blue. Why did he do that? Well, one good reason is that it's very expensive. The blue is very expensive. He should do it, no question, he should do it. But you hear where he's coming from when he says, it's very expensive and I'm just not ready to put out that much money for the blue thread. He's struggling with a well-known, well-recognized Yetzahara, evil inclination. But the guy who puts on all blue, something very funny is going on there. Because the white threads are trivial. They cost next to nothing. They're very plentiful. When you're in the shuk next time, pick up some white threads and put them on your, on your senses. Why in heaven's name would you avoid the white thread? The answer is that doing the mitzvah in the best possible way isn't even worth a dollar, which is what the white threads will cost you. It isn't even worth a dollar. It isn't even worth the 10 minutes in the shuk to pick it up. The person who doesn't put it in the blue says, but it's $100. 
and you only sell them on the first Thursday of the month, and you have to go to Meron to get them. That's a big deal. I'm just, you know, that's too much for me. Him, you can understand. So here you're measuring the size of the failure by the, by the implied significance of the mitzvah to the person. I think that's what my Rebbe is saying, and I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm not saying it's the only way to explain why it's on a higher level, but, but I think it makes a lot of sense to explain it in this one way. Yeah. Is, is it not related at all with what happened with Korach? Uh, with Korach, it's, it's a little bit different. There he said, if the garment is all blue, the whole garment, why does it need any fringe at all? Don't put any fringe on it. So now, I'm thinking now, yeah, I never thought of this. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Um, but if the garment is all blue, what about the white? That's a very interesting point. I never understood that he's got at least two mistakes there. One is he thinks that the tzitz is really the blue. Ah, white might. Well, it's really the blue. And the garment's all blue. You don't need to have more blue standing out. And that, everybody says, but it's not true because the blue that's in the garment, every thread is identical to every other thread. And inherently, in a social grouping, someone has to stand out, be different, and be the leader. That's what he was against. He said, Kola Eda Kulam Kedoshim, Vubitzacham Hashem. The whole congregation is, is holy. God is among them. Don't stand out. Don't be better. Don't be above. You know, it's real democracy. But that's all based on the false assumption that all you need is blue. Never occurred to me to ask. But it's also, with a garment that's all blue, you don't have white. And if the tzitzit requires white and blue, at the very least you would need white. I never heard anybody ask that question. I think it's a very good question. So, I mean, and they have to figure out what else is going wrong with his, with his philosophy. That he misses that as well. I'll, ch I'll check that with people. But it's a nice thought. Okay. So now, Rambam, Hey, paragraph 5 says, All the prophets commanded us to do tshuva. All right. Tshuva is a mitzvah. And they commanded us to do it. Ve'ein Yisrael negolim elo b'tshuva. Jewish people will not be re, uh, redeemed unless they do tshuva. This is a machlekes of the Gemara, a long, complicated discussion in Rebbe Lezim of Yeshua. The Rebbe is taking the side that that tshuva is necessary. For hivticha Torah shesov Yisrael asov tshuva, masov galusan. The Torah has promised. That at the end of our exile, we will do tshuva. And as soon as they do tshuva, they will be um, redeemed. Shinemar. Because the verse says, When all these predictions of terrible disasters will have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have placed before you, God is speaking, and you shall place these, these words and ideas on your heart. In all the nations where God has cast you off to that place, cast you off from the land of Israel to that place. Now here the Rambam enforces his translation. Others disagree with his translation. His translation is, you will do tshuva. And you'll, re and you'll uh, listen to his voice. This is what I'm, command what I'm commanding you. Will immediately, the Rambam is telling us, uh, undo your exile. He'll have mercy on you, and he will gather you together. In all the places where he has scattered you out. Now, those words in the verse can be read another way. When you are in the land where you're in exile and, and the curse of blessed and the curse come to you and you put them on your heart, then I'm telling you, do tshuva. In the Hebrew, it's ambiguous. When you write the future or you write a past that you make it to the future where it's not an imperative, the Hebrew, Hebrew language has imperatives. An imperative says, do it. 
when the verse, the verse uses language which is, pure, which is future, it could mean this is what will happen, or it can mean, <laughs> in English we have a nice distinction, this is what you will do, or this is what you shall do. And shall means I'm telling you to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to be in trouble. So others take this to be a command to do tshuva. These verses in the book of Deuteronomy, that's a command to do tshuva. Those who are with me from the very beginning, you know the Ramav does not learn the mitzvah of tshuva from there. He learns it from a verse which is describing a certain sacrifice, and it says, vadu es They should confess the transgression that they have performed, and for him, confession is a key to the whole institution of tshuva, because he takes those verses in the book of Deuteronomy as a prediction as to what will happen, not as a command. But what I'm pointing out is that this position isn't, isn't forced upon you because others take the position that these, verse, these verses are commanding. Okay, so number one, we're commanded to do it. Number two, it is a key element in redemption. Great is tshuva, halacha vav. Gedol tshuva, shemekareves asa odom l'shchina. Great is tshuva that draws a person close to HaKadosh Baruch to Hashem. Shinemar, as it says, Shuva Yisrael ad Hashem Elokecha. Return, O Israel, to, up to, Hashem your God. Now, the word in Hebrew, ad, is like the word until in English. And it's ambiguous. If I say until X, sometimes until X means keep going and don't stop until you have X accomplished. Sometimes until X means keep going up to X, but stop before you get to X. I'll give you an example. Uh, you, you qualify for this reward until your 60th birthday. So on your 60th birthday, do you get the reward or not? You do not. But suppose I say, cook until well done. I mean, keep cooking and don't stop cooking until it's already well done. I don't mean stop before it's well done. So there's sometimes until X means until and including X. And sometimes until X means until and excluding X. And it varies from context to context. What we say in Hebrew is ad ad bechlam, or ad lo ad bechlam. Ad something, and the thing that I said ad to is with, included in what you're supposed to accomplish or not. Here, the Pasuk is used, and the Gemara actually has a disagreement about, about tshuva, how tshuva is supposed, to, is supposed to, to work. Now, I was discussing this with one of my daughters yesterday. She has a group that she provides materials for. And it occurred to me that what we said yesterday might be a good illustration of this. It might be a good illustration of this. Remember yesterday we talked about the Gemara that says that um, a, 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 a tzadi gomer, a person who never sinned, can't stand in the place, can't is the Ramah's words, can't stand in the place where Baal Tshuva stands. Baal Tshuva is on a higher level. And I told you that there's only one view. The Gemara has an opposing view. It's just very rarely quoted, but in fact there, there are two views in the Gemara. Now, the explanation for the Rambam's quotation is what he says. We just spoke about it. That the Baal Tshuva has to work harder because he tasted the taste of the transgression. He had now an experiential attraction to the transgression and he has to overcome that so he gets more reward. He's on a higher level. What would be the explanation of the other point of view that the Tzadi Gomer is on a higher level? So we said yesterday, the name of Rabbi, I can't remember his first name, Feldman in Baltimore. Um, who says the taste of the Avera is sweet? Maybe when the person is doing the transgressions, he feels that his life is meaningless, his life is a waste, it has no value, it has no significance, and he's attracted to a life of Torah because he wants to avoid, he wants to rid himself of the angst, the anui coming from the 20th century existentialists, poor fellows, um, of living without meaning, without significance. Victor Frankl was right. Meaning, the, the need for meaning is an organic need of a human being. 
So that kind of Baal Tshuva is running away from something worse. That's on a much lower level. The Tzaddik's not running away from something worse. He's doing it because it is what it is. The first type of Baal Tshuva is doing it for what it is and he's overcoming the resistance. So you have three levels. The first kind of Baal Tshuva, the Tzaddik, and then the second kind of Baal Tshuva. Now maybe you could say Shuva Ad Hashem Elokech, where the Ad means up to and including attachment to the Kodesh Baruch Hu, that's the first type of Baal Tshuva. But where it means up to but not including attachment, that's the second type of Baal Tshuva. Because part of what is motivating the second type of Baal Tshuva is, I don't want to be that. His motivation is not holy. I want to be this. Part of it is, I don't want to be that. I must tell you, when we decided to make Aliyah, we lived in Baltimore for 10 years, 10 wonderful years. Baltimore community was and is a wonderful community. Um, but we did feel that our children were growing up with the feeling we are what we are because we're not that. There were non-Jews living in the same neighborhood, and they were certainly aware of it, living in a non-Jewish country, and they felt that they, they were building their identity partly on a we're not that foundation. And we felt that it would be uh, a, a more solid spiritual identity to be building it in positive terms and not in negative terms. So when we came to Eretz Israel, our oldest was 12 when we came to Eretz Israel, and the rest of them grew up here more, because of the younger ones for sure. We had one that was born here. Um, and here they were surrounded by a from community. And although here too you hear, uh, but it's not, it's not in your face as we say. You're not seeing it, walking, you know, walking down the street, you know, wondering why all the cars are going by on Shabbos and so on and so on. Your, 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 your context is a positive context. Anyway, so the Rama quotes this verse, Shum Yisrael Adashem Elokecha, V'neemar, Lo shavtem adai nuum Hashem, in criticizing them when they haven't done tshuva, you haven't, you haven't done tshuva ad, ad to me, up to me. V'neemar, in tashuv, Yisrael, nuum Hashem, elai tashuv, if you're going to do tshuva, Jewish people, Come back to me, and here Eli is not until, but it's to me. Klomar, im taxo betshuva, be tidbak. Now I think you could ask whether the Rambam meant that on the last verse or only the last verse. If you do tshuva, you will be attached to me. Um, this goes together with what he said before. Don't think that your your transgressions hold you back. And I will insert a short remark here among the many. Um, misunderstandings of the Rambam is that he was a philosopher and he believed in philosophy and his whole worship of God was knowledge of God and he might just as well have been Aristotle wearing, you know, wearing a hat. Uh, it's definitely, absolutely, desperately wrong. Desperately wrong. The Rambam stresses in the Moran Vuchin several times, Dveikus, this Ubo Tedbat, you'll be attached to him, conscious, communion, identification, experience of God. When he discusses the book of Job, in one short section, he says something which I think is gigantic. He says, the book of Job is designed to teach, among other things, is designed to teach that dveikus, dveikus, attachment to God is the only good. It's the only thing that's good. Nothing else is good. Not happiness and not health and not wealth and not and not uh, uh, good reputation and not only attachment to God. That's all it is. There's nothing else. So when he says here, if you do tshuva or both tidbak, it means you're going to get to the highest level. Nothing will hold you back. It's the absolutely highest level. And Drake is, is 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 not knowledge because he himself explicitly distinguishes it from knowledge. He distinguishes it from knowledge. He says, <laughs> I never know how to interpret these things. He says in the middle of a chapter, I've discovered something new, something exciting. I have an answer to a question that's bothered me for a long time, and I'm here I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> he planned the book from beginning to end. He has cross references throughout the book. I'm going to do this in that chapter over there. I did this in that chapter over there. 
you know, so I don't know whether he's trying to excite the reader or what, exactly what he's doing. But what he says is, I have a solution to why great people suffer. He said, because what protects them from suffering is their conscious attachment to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Knowledge? No, not knowledge. It's not the knowledge that does it. It's the conscious attachment, so he says. A person who has all the knowledge and has the conscious attachment will be protected. But if he loses the conscious attachment, turns his attention away, he doesn't forget what he's learned. He still remembers it. Give him a quiz. He'll get 100. But he's lost his conscious attachment. Then he says he's not protected anymore. Mm. You know, if you need any clearer explanation, a, a demonstration, the Rambam is not talking about being a philosopher. You have your philosophical laws when you're asleep. He's talking about being consciously attached. So this vacus is the high, not only the highest, it's the only real value. Everything else is only a means. has no intrinsic value. But he says over here, Ubo Tidbach, that when you do tshuva, your whole past history will not uh, prevent you from achieving dveikus. He's telling you you, you you can achieve the highest possible spiritual accomplishment in spite of the fact of what you have done in the past. Hachuva b'kareus eserachokim. Oh, this, this is it's absolutely beautiful. Emesh hayezes sanui lefnei amakom. We're talking about a person who's done terrible averus, terrible transgressions. Tshuva draw, draws close those who were far away, far away. Yesterday, last night, last night, this person was hated by God. Meshukatz, God thought of him as disgusting. Umaruchak, distance. Toeva, uh, an abomination. That's how God felt about him yesterday. Now, this isn't the person who forgot to have a mincha. We had some pretty serious transgressors in our, in our history. You know, kings who forced people to worship idols and, and who killed prophets and so forth and so on. We were really, really guilty of high crimes. Vayom Menashem, Menashe de Tshuva. Vayom hu Ahuv, he's beloved. Nechmad, God has pleasure in him. Korov, close, v'yedid, and a friend. You find that the very same language that is expressed for the distancing those who have committed transgressions is the very same language that's used for talking about their rehabilitation, their reattachment to God. Whether you're talking about an individual or the community. In place of the fact that it once was said of the Jewish people, you're, they're not my people, that is the language by which he expresses distance. They'll be called the children of the living God. So the very same language with which your distance was described, the opposite of that language is being used to describe the closeness that you have after you do tshuva. V'neemar, b'yachonya, b'rish uso, when yachonya was in his evil phase, kids was the isha zeh, ariri, gever lo yitzlach, b'yomav. Write down this person as as having no offspring, a, a, a man who will not be successful in his days. And now, if he'll be king of the, uh, uh, of the Jewish people, he'll be like the signet ring on my finger. I'll make you like the ring on my finger. Just as he was discarded of that language, so he's brought close to that language. Now, I think, again, this all goes with the Rambam's idea that when you do tshuva, you disconnect from your history. You're not the person who did those things. Since you're not the person who did them, they don't hold you back. You're, you're qualified to, to, to reach the highest 
possible achievement, just as you were before you did those things. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask the question over for the recording. It's important to answer the question. It helps to clarify. So we're now discussing the status of a Baal Tshuva and, <coughs> and, the, and the fact that nothing holds him back and that he can achieve the highest levels. And he's asking, I distinguish two different types of Baal Tshuva. Does it apply to both of them? The one who does it in spite of the um, difficulty of overcoming his desires, which is the only positive motivation, versus the one who does it to avoid a meaningless life? And the answer is no, they're not equal. Because the Rambam only mentions one. He only mentions the higher Baal Tshuva. He doesn't mention the other Baal Tshuva. The other Baal Tshuva I mentioned because in the Gemara, there are two different opinions as to the status of a Baal Tshuva. And I was explaining the second opinion, but the Rambam doesn't quote that opinion. Why not? Well, on the surface, the two opinions contradict one another. Yeah. So can't both be true, unless there's some way of reconciling them, they can't both be true. And when the, st- the standard methodology is, when you have two statements in the Gemara that contradict one another, you have to decide which one to accept. See, uh, later generations had to codify the law. And the law is not just practical. It's not just, you know, what do you eat, what, how do you keep Shabbos. The law also teaches us the right beliefs, the right principles, the right understanding, the right goals, the right values. So if you have a difference, of, if you have a, difference a, a, a contradiction between two Gemaras, is the job of the later generation to, if he can, try to choose the one which the entire Talmudic corpus would support more strongly. And of course, as you can imagine, on later generations there will be different differences of opinion about that. But that's part of Talmudic scholarship. So as I, as I pointed out, um, in terms of the relationship of the Baal Tshuva to his past, there are two statements in the Gemara. One is the one the Marmel quotes, which I just now mentioned a couple of times. You're not the same person who did it. And the other is, let's say if you do Tshuva out of love of God, you can convert the past transgressions into positive mitzvahs and get reward for them. Those two can't both be true. If you didn't do it, you can't get reward for it. So the Rambam chose that Gemara that you're detached from them. There's another Gemara that he quotes that says, when you change your name, one of the things Baal Tshuva does, he changes his name. By changing his name, as if to say, I'm not the person who did that. So then that other Gemara isn't available to him. Now here you have what's clearly a machlekes in the Gemara, who's on a higher level, the Baal Tshuva or the Tzadik. One says the Baal Tshuva and one says the Tzadik. So they're definitely disagreeing. So... I only explained the other one who says that the tzaddik is on a higher level by explaining what kind of Baal Tshuva is being, is being discussed there. The Rambam is not passing that way. He's passing this way. So th- that means he's taking the, the side that Baal Tshuva is on a higher level. That's the only Baal Tshuva he's talking about, and that's the one he's talking about here. So that, so that fits very well with, you know, with what we said. Yeah. Um, is the Rambam a tzaddik gamur, or is he also Baal Tshuva? He himself? Why do you ask? What, what I do you mean, mean, since he sees in such a high uh, you know, perception... Uh, We're not in the business of judging people. We're not in the business of, of analyzing people. Right. That's God's business. He said that in chapter 3. We read it. The only God who knows the heart can evaluate what a, people, a person does. Uh, that he was a tzaddik is no yeah. question. But tzaddik Gomer, the Rambam himself writes at the beginning of that chapter that every human being has some transgressions. Every human being has some transgressions. Now, we have a rule in the Gemara that if you see a great person perform a transgression, which could happen, by tomorrow, the next day, don't have any doubts about him, don't have any qualifications about him because he for sure did tshuva. That's what tshuva is for. Tshuva is for repairing mistakes so that you could leave the world clean. So that's what we would assume about someone like the Rambam. But, uh, you know, as I say, 
It's not up to us to, to evaluate people and to pronounce on their, on their level. Um, okay. Kama mu'ula malas ha how great the level of tshuva is. This is a, it's a repeat of what he said before, but with different nuances. Emesh, last night, Ha'ezah moved down Hashem Adolkei Yisrael. He was, this person was separated. There was a barrier between him and Echadosh Baruch Hu, Shinemar, an explicit verse, Avano Seichem, Hayu Mavdilim, Beinechem, Levein Adolkeichem. Your transgressions were a barrier separating you from your God. So ek ve'ein onena. Now here we have some interesting descriptions. He cries out to God and he's not answered. He's not answered. Shinemar gam ki sabus and then shomea. You can pray all you want. Multiply the prayers that you hear. I don't hear. You often hear means to, to accept and act on. It's not the Kodesh Baruch who you know, goes on vacation. We don't have such ideas. He does mitzvahs and they're ripped away from him in his face. There's a bitter, bitter verse describing people who go to the temple on the holidays to appear in the courtyard. And God says to, through the prophet, who requested this of you Trampling my courtyard. Trampling my courtyard. I don't want you here. They're doing a mitzvah. I don't want you here. That means. You know. So now, I think there's a very deep idea here. I heard this from the Belzer Rebbe about, well, I heard it in 1977 from the President Belzer Rebbe. It was Shabbos Chazon, just before Tisha B'Av. Happened to be there for Shabbos Shudas. And he said a very, very deep, deep idea. There are mitzvos where there are verses that tell us that if a person is wicked, he's better off not doing them. And then there are many mitzvos for which that's not said. So, for example, Omar Hashem the Rasha, Malachal Saper Chukai. He says to the wicked person, why are you reciting my, my, my laws? Don't want to have you do that. Zevech um, v'shoim to eva. Sacrifice of a, of a wicked person is an abomination. Uh, here we've heard the verse that uh, if you pray, I won't hear you. I won't, I won't uh, pay attention to you. Um, one second. I'm trying to remember the other ones. Maybe, maybe they'll come back to me. So the Belgian Rebbe said like this. And the starting point you, probably, you may not know, so it's important to, to, to get the whole story. Mitzvos are not an end unto themselves. Mitzvos are a means. This may sound strange and maybe a little um, lightheaded, but the Zohar says it. Tayag itin, itin in, in Jerusalem Aramaic means etzos, strategies, advice. A strategy is a way to get something else. Advice tells you how to achieve what you want. There are 613 strategies. What are they strategies for? Okay, if you put together what I said eight and a half minutes ago, we're where we are now, for the vehicles. Attaching to a God's Baruch just like the Rambam said. That's what this strategy is for. The hope is that in doing a mitzvah, you create a connection with the Kodesh Baruch. Each mitzvah creates a different kind of connection, different strength of connection, different quality of connection, but the goal of every mitzvah is to be connected to a Kodesh Baruch. That's the goal of every mitzvah. But in addition to that, some mitzvahs have connection to the Kodesh Baruch as their theme. The performance is a performance of connection to the Kodesh Baruch. For the other mitzvahs, it's a it's a it's a totso, it's a consequence. Having done the mitzvah, the consequence will be that it will produce an attachment. So, for example, let's say prayer. Okay. 
uh, in prayer, you're standing before Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's your posture. You come into the palace, Kodesh Baruch is on the throne, and you're standing before him. So not just that when you pray, the result of prayer is that it will cause you to be connected next week. It's acting out the connection. In, in, in study of Torah, he speaks to us. In prayer, we speak to him. In study of Torah, he speaks to us. So that's also acting out that direct connection. You come to the courtyard of the temple. Why are you coming to the courtyard of the temple? Because that's where he is. That's where he manifests his presence. The second sentence explains the first. <coughs> He's really everywhere. But he manifests himself there. Shechina, the word Shechina means that which dwells. The Shkon is to dwell. His presence dwells in the temple. You go there to be with him, to be face to face with him. So, the, said the Belt of Rebbe, those mitzvahs whose performance acts out connection with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, if you're speaking to a person who's wicked, it's, it's a contradiction. It's a joke. It's, it's a cruel joke. Because you're acting out what you would be doing when you're standing face to face. And in your inner life, you're totally disconnected. So the acting out is a lie. And that's why it's not, it's not tolerated. Offering a sacrifice. You're there, and you have this interaction with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, and in your heart, you think something else. The prophets talk about this to you. You oppress the widow and the orphan, and you steal money, and you don't free the slaves, and, and then you come and offer a sacrifice in my temple. I don't want sacrifices like that. Don't make the mistake of the people who read three verses out of, out of 10,000 and then tell you what it means. God doesn't like sacrifices. God doesn't like sacrifices by people who are using the performance to cover up and excuse themselves from missing out on the inner connection. If it expresses the inner connection, of course it's a mitzvah. So it should be done. So there is this crucial, this crucial difference between the mitzvahs that are, the fact that all mitzvahs create connection versus the ones whose theme is connection. Now the ones that Rama brings here, and there are more, but the ones he brings here, he says that this wicked person last night, Kodesh Baruch Hu, ripped up the mitzvahs from his, from, his, uh, from his hands. The mitzvahs he has here are the ones that the Belder Rebbe is talking about. They're the ones where the performance acts out connection with God, which he doesn't have. It doesn't, it's not clear from the Rambam that, that it means all mitzvahs. It might be that these are only examples. Or it might be, according to the Belder Rebbe's analysis, that these are being chosen. In other words, he says, uh, yeah, yes, yesterday evening, how bad was he? Um, he says, Ose mitzvos. So, no. Shinemar. The Ose mitzvos, the Torfin Osan, the fun of, whether that means every last mitzvah that he does, or no, it's not every last mitzvah that he does, but it is some of them, which is bad enough. So then, that, w that would be a, a tragic position to be in. He speaks about the, the, the sacrifice. All that. For Hayom, now that he's done tshuva, who mudbak b'shechina. Again, mudbak, dveikus. I'm using the word dveikus. Shinam about tema dveiki b'shem alokechem. You are attached to the Kodesh Baruch Tzoeg v'nana. If he cries out in prayer, he'll be answered miyad. Even before you cry out, I know what you're going to ask for. I prepared the, I prepared the answer from before. For the mitzvah, umekavir osam, benachas, umesimcha. When he does mitzvah, the Kodesh Baruch receives them with, with pleasure and with joy. Shalemar. Because Baruch Hu has accepted your actions as, as uh, appropriate and favorable. Because Baruch Hu, I don't know why this is plural, desires them. I think it's a mistake in the Gersa here. 
Minchas Yehuda Rishalayim Ki Mei Olam Rishalayim Kedmon Yos It's got to be mis- It's got to be mis- Ave He wants them He wants their Their mitzvahs now Now that they've done Shuvah So this is The The gigantic Promise To a person Who becomes a Baal Shuvah Um Okay, just one more thought. Bali tshuva daka liyos shfolim va'anovim biyoser. The way of a of a of a bal tshuva to be shafel and anav. Now, the Rambam, as I know, doesn't define these terms. Shafel means lowly, lowly of of low spirit, um, self denying. Um, feeling worthless. Anav is translated in English as humble. At least for the Ramchal, these are two very different concepts. Shval um, Ruach is what, what we said, you feel, you feel worthless. Anav says the Ramchal means that I feel I'm not worthy of praise for my great qualities. A Balta Gaiva, who's a, per, who's a person who's guilty of pride, feels I am worthy of praise for my great qualities. But both have great qualities. Both the honor and the Balgaiva both have great qualities. It's just a question of whether I take credit for my greatness or not. If a person thinks he's worthless, he doesn't get into the ballpark of Humility versus pride. Mm. So these are two very different concepts. Now, one difference that you find in the in Chazal, this was pointed out, I forget but which, uh, it was in the Gemara that I was learning, one of the commentators pointed out, I forget who points it out. You'll have places where Shval Ruach is not correct. Not always should you think that you're nothing. But Anov is always correct. So they're obviously of different concepts. Sometimes a person has to take leadership. Sometimes a person has to make a decision and trust his own judgment. Moses, as I'll tell us, three times did very dramatic things on his own without being instructed by Kodesh Baruch Hu. And all three times, Kodesh Baruch Hu congratulated him and confirmed what he did. He broke the luchos, the tablets. They weren't his tablets. But he broke them anyway. I, 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 I'm happy you did that. He separated from his wife. Hmm. How many children did Moses have? Two. Both boys. There's a mitzvah of procreation. You may have heard. The mitzvah requires that you have a boy and a girl. Moses never fulfilled that mitzvah. Yet he separated from his wife. Hello, Demarhu. You know, that's a little surprising. Because Baruch said to me afterwards, you did right. I know why you did it. I know it was your purpose. And in your case, you're different from other people. And you did right. And the third thing is, perhaps even more surprising, because Baruch said to, to Moses, prepare the people for the revelation at Sinai. Tell them, prepare yourselves for two days. On the third day, I'm going to appear on the mountain. Okay? Moses goes to the people and says, Prepare yourselves for three days. Oh, really? Now, you could hear, well, preparation for the event is on the first two days, and the third day, that's the day of the event. So, of course, you better be prepared. I mean, because that's the, the climax of the whole thing. You could hear it that way. But one authority of the Gemara doesn't hear it that way. He hears, because Baruch Hu said, prepare for two, and I'll appear on three. And Moses said to the people, prepare for three, and he'll appear on four. He added an extra day on his own. Added an extra day to the revelation at Sinai. You know, these are astounding things. Because Rocco congratulated him afterwards and said, Yes, you did the right thing. This is not a Shval Ruach. This is not a person who says, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I can't trust my judgment because what do I understand? I can't trust my evaluations because who knows they're right. That's not it. That's not it. So another realizing that you have no clue. How much of your great qualities is due to your effort and how much is due to a Baruch Hu's investment in you 
And there it's very difficult to evaluate, logically, that you deserve credit for your great qualities. That can accompany you always. There's no exceptions to another. But there, is, there are exceptions to Shfal Ruach, where thinking of yourself as nothing and thereby not being able to take the initiative or take a leadership role can be wrong, can be the wrong thing to do. So the two really are, in this definition, different concepts. So I'm not saying that, that that's according to Ramam's definition, but when you hear the two concepts, you have to realize there is a question about defining them and, and distinguishing them. Batshuva uh, has um, typically will be both. In particular, when a person has failed, let's say failed in a pretty significant way, he ought to doubt himself. He ought to think at least his self-control, let alone his judgment. So often people rationalize what they do, and that means that they allow this, the cognitive dissonance to corrupt their minds. That's, even, that's much worse, much better to be honest and to realize what you're doing is wrong and to regret it and to try to make a better, bigger effort and pray to uh, for help in, in making the effort and to allow it to corrupt your mind and to rationalize as if it weren't, as it weren't wrong. Um, but the, there has to be a sense of self-doubt in a person who, who's about tshuva. And that will create a sense of, of, of shval ruach, um, in addition to the idea of another. Okay, we'll pick it up again tomorrow in session.